Hi, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. We've got the whole family of Oberheim OB synthesizers here, so let's fix one of them. Today I'm going to be repairing this OB-8 for a customer. The problem he's having is there's no audio output from the synth. He says it powers up and the switches respond to the button presses, but the synth hasn't worked for 12 years. So let's power it up and see what's going on. So it does power up, and it is responding to button presses. But sure enough, there's no audio output. Before we even open up this synthesizer, let's do one more thing to try to get as much information as we can so we can narrow down our troubleshooting to the right spot. And we're going to do that by hitting the auto-tune button. Uh, the way auto-tune works is it assigns control voltages to each oscillator of each of the eight voices and then measures the frequency of the audio output coming from the voice. In this way, it can determine what offsets need to be added to the keyboard control voltage for each oscillator so they will sound in tune. So if any of the voices, the eight voices, can successfully auto-tune, we'll know that we can get control voltages to the voices and that the voices can output audio. So here it's going through the auto-tune routine for each of the voices, and it's indicating which voice is tuning. And at the end, uh, this number 8 is flashing here. So that means that voices 1 to 7 passed auto-tune and voice 8 failed auto-tune. So control voltages are getting to the voice boards and they are outputting sound, but we're just not hearing it. When I say they're outputting sound, I mean they're outputting an audio signal, but it's not making it out to our amp. So here's a page of the voice board schematics. Each voice board has four voices on it, and there's two voice boards in the synthesizer. This OSC MUX signal is where the auto-tune picks up the voice card output, so we know our signal's making it at least this far. On each voice board, there's a CEM3360 used as a final VCA and a dual op amp for the left and right channels. Connectors C1 and C2 here is where the upper four voices join with the lower four voices, and then it goes on to the output jacks. So if our problem is this final VCA stage, uh, this will have had to have failed on both voice boards to explain why we don't have sound. And that doesn't really seem probable. I mean, you know what they say about lightning striking the same place twice. I think a more reasonable explanation would be that the output jack is bad. So let's move off the mono jack and over to try the left and right jacks. So this is the mono output. And I'm going to switch over to the left output. And it's still not working. I'll go to the right output. And it's, it's, it's not working there either. So uh, it's possible that this connector here, connector B, that actually um, carries the signals to the jacks is just disconnected because otherwise things look pretty weird and odds defying. I really doubt that all three of these jacks have failed or that both of the final VCAs on those two separate boards both failed. Uh, anyway, at this point, we have a good idea where we can start our troubleshooting when we get inside the synth. We're going to start by making sure that connector to the jacks is plugged in. And uh, if it is, that would also be a good spot to start looking for a signal and tracing this problem with an oscilloscope. So here are the output jacks, and here are the wires going down to this connector, and that connector is plugged in. So before we dive into troubleshooting, let's actually take a look around inside this synthesizer. It looks like at some point someone replaced the bridge rectifier here for the 5-volt line with a beefier one. 
The bridge rectifiers in the Oberheim OBs were underrated, and as such, they run super hot and have a very high failure rate, particularly this one on the 5-volt line. In the power supply rebuild kits that I sell, I provide replacements for all three bridge rectifiers with a higher current rating, and they fit in a lot more cleanly than, than this one. So I'm noticing that the battery is leaking and corrosion is starting to work its way down the lead of that battery toward the circuit board. Once we get this keyboard up and running, we'll remove the old battery and install my battery eliminator modules so the owner will never need to change the battery again or worry about damage to the circuit board like this from leaking batteries. If you want to learn more about the battery eliminator, click up here in the upper right corner for my video on it. So here are the voice boards. As I mentioned, there's two voice boards and there's four voices, identical sets of circuitry for each of the voices. So there's four voices on each of the boards. Uh, the voice boards here look, pr look pretty much all original. And we know that one of the voices is already failing auto-tune. So when we get this synth working, it's likely that we're going to find that the voice boards could benefit from some service. If you want to learn more about servicing OB8 voice boards, click up here in the corner for my other video on that. All right, let's do some troubleshooting. So we're going to be uh, looking on this connector, connector B, and let's look at the mono output, because if there's anything from the left or the right, we should be able to see it there. So the mono is B2, and uh, this isn't labeled, but we can see if we start on this side, there is no pin 2, so it's probably this one. And if there's any confusion, we could just follow it back up to the jack there. And, yep, that, that is the mono one. So I'm going to put my probe here on this pin. And let's get some keys. So, nothing. Let's zoom in here. So we're at uh, 50 millivolts. Let's go even down to 20 millivolts per division. And there's nothing on the scope. But, um... The phone. Hang on a second. Do, do you uh, do you notice what I'm noticing? Uh, the, uh, the the LEDs, the gate LEDs, aren't lighting up on the voice boards. Let me um, let me swing around back here. Try hitting auto tune. Well, what do you know? So the uh, gate LEDs are lighting up from auto-tune, but not lighting up when I'm pressing keys on the, the key bed. So this is very interesting. So the CPU is able to gate the voices through the auto-tune program, but playing on the keyboard, they're not being gated. So maybe what we do at this point is we hook up a MIDI controller and see, see what happens then. Okay, so I've got a small MIDI controller hooked up here. Oh! It works. So, uh, it's skipping four notes because this voice board's not plugged in. Let me actually lower this down and then run auto-tune and uh, we'll, see, we'll see what it sounds like. So through the MIDI controller, it's working. Uh, I mean, the voices sound very inconsistent from voice to voice, and this uh, voice 8 here failed auto-tune and was removed, but we're actually getting audio output. So it looks like the problem uh, is with the keybed scanning, um, not like a problem with the audio output. I had done a video in the past of how the Oberheims scan their key beds. If you want to check that video out, click in the upper right. But as a brief refresher, this is the schematic of the OB8 key bed switch matrix. These are the eight columns of the switch matrix that get activated, and these are the eight rows of the switch matrix that get read in to determine which of the eight keys in that column are currently being pressed. These rows are actually shared with the rows of the potboard switch matrix. You see these lines SWD0 through SWD7 on the right. These are the same lines for the rows of the front panel switch matrix, and we know those buttons are working. 
So that means that these buffers down here and any other logic after that point that gets this stuff to the CPU is working fine. But the logic that activates the columns of this matrix is a little separate. Each column in both of these switch matrices is addressable from the CPU. So the CPU puts an address on the address bus and reads the state of the switches on the data bus. There are some other chips that help decode the upper bits of this address, but basically when the CPU is making a read request to the switch matrix, this latch U52 is going to latch the lowest six bits of the address on the address bus. It looks like four of those bits are used to address the switch matrix columns. And a little inverter here is used so the lowest eight bits will address the key bed switch matrix and the upper eight bits will address the panel switch matrix. So again, since we know the panel switch matrix is working, this chip, U51, which is a BCD binary coded decimal decoder, is where we're going to want to look. We want to see that those pins, uh, output pins, 0 through 8, sorry, 0 through 7, are toggling to show that the CPU is scanning the keyboard switch matrix. So getting back to the scope, again, we're going to be looking to see that the, uh, the uh, lowest 8 bits of the BCD decoder are toggling for the uh, switch matrix columns uh, for the, the key bed scanning. So that's U51 pins 1 to 7 and, and pin 9. So 1 is here. I think we're going to need to uh, go out on uh, here. Maybe come up here, change the time. So, yeah, you see that this is a, it's mostly high, but it's going low for some period of time. So, so it is activating those, uh, that column. Let's check the other ones. Yes. 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 So, so it is scanning the, um, it is scanning the columns. So I don't think probing the rows would do much good because they're shared with the panel um, switch matrix and, and we know that that's working already. Um, but in any case, we already know that the rows are making it to the CPU. So the, the problem seems to be with the key bed or the connection to the key bed. So let's check to make sure that, that underneath here it's actually plugged in and that it's plugged in correctly. So the key bed was uh, missing a few screws holding it in place. This whole, whole keyboard's missing a lot of screws, and we'll replace them when we uh, put everything back together. But the ribbon cable here under the key bed is connected, and it is facing the correct way. And it's plugged in correctly here on the processor board as well. So I think at this point what we'll do is we'll take this cable off, and we'll measure it. Uh, we'll check it for continuity and make sure that the cable is good. You will be wise to use an IC socket to disconnect the, uh, an IC extractor to disconnect these um, from their IC sockets. Otherwise, you'll probably wind up damaging the, uh, the cable. Here's the cable. Pins look okay. Let's check it with a meter. Okay, here we go. So, uh, pin one on this cable is here. Pin one on this cable, on this end of the cable is here. We'll just go down. So the cable is fine. So the problem is with the uh, key bed. So let's confirm on the key bed with the multimeter. So to test the key bed, we want to see if the rows and the columns of the switch matrix have continuity with the IC socket here that's used as a connector. And we don't see the side of the board with the traces and we don't want to disassemble the key bed for now. Uh, so for the rows, for the rows what we can do is we can measure continuity between the connector and the cathode of, of each of the diodes. So it's safe to assume that the diodes here under the key bed are in the same order as the keys. So this would be the diode for key C0, C sharp 0, D0, 
and, and so on. So starting with uh, C0 and going every eighth key, so we're going to look for row, row 0 is pin 10 on the connector, so it's uh, 8, 9, 10. So there's continuity there. You see there's no continuity to the neighboring key. So we go down from C0, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and, and so on. So there is, there is continuity here, at least to this row. So for the, for the columns here, we're going to need to measure continuity between the IC socket and the anode, uh, the banded side of the diode. But this time, you see there's a little switch there. We're going to need to press the key in order to get, get a beep from our meter. So let's try this on um, C, C0. So row C0 is in column 0, which is pin 16 here on the IC socket, and we're going to go on to the anode of this first diode and press the first key, and we're not getting a beep. So um, let's actually confirm that, that this particular diode is good. So I'm going to turn my meter over to the diode mode, and uh, this will measure the voltage drop across a diode. So let's, uh, let's do this. So yeah, we're getting a, a 0.6 volt drop across the diode, so the diode is good. So now what I'll do is I will move um, <coughs> off, the, uh, off the anode, I'll move over back here to the, uh, to the column and press the key and, and, uh, and nothing. So. Um, I'm going to check some other keys, some other columns and rows, and uh, I'll let you know what I find. So I went through the key bed, and it turns out all the rows, so the, uh, the continuity between the IC socket and the cathode of the diodes is all good, but the continuity when the key is pressed between the uh, column and the anode of the diode is not there for all of the columns. So they, we've confirmed that the, the problem with this OB8 uh, not having any output is, is due to this faulty key bed. And, you know, there, there could be a couple reasons. There could be this maybe cracked solder joints on this, on this socket. Uh, there could be some damage to the board on the other side. It could be that every single key contact on the, the, the key bed is, is bad. But uh, let's let's face it. This is a uh, Panasonic key bed, not a Pratt Reed key bed, and it's noisy. It's got these these terrible key contacts, and it, this one is already missing a key, and and it's completely broken um, to top it off. So this is actually a good candidate to just replace the whole key bed with a more modern Fatar key bed. So I'm going to check with the owner and see if he wants me to troubleshoot this key bed further or if I can just go ahead and replace the key bed at this point. And I'll also go over the other findings and see what else he'd like me to do to this synth. So I finished up this OB8. I wound up replacing the key bed with this new Fatar key bed. You can hear it's a much quieter and smoother than the original Panasonic key bed. Maybe at some point I'll get to conduct an autopsy on the old key bed to see what the deal was with it, but this solution is going to be much better than fixing the old key bed. I made a little adapter with cabling that lets you hook a Fatar key bed up to an OB8, OBXA, or OBX. Here it is mounted at the bottom of the case. I've made the adapters and cabling available on my website. At least for the time being, I'm not planning on selling key beds. So if you want to have a go at it yourself, you're on your own with where to get the key bed and how to mount it inside the synth. I've also removed the battery and installed the battery eliminator modules. And I've serviced the voice boards by installing my service kit and then giving it a full calibration. As I went through the calibration process, I found a handful of issues with the voice boards and wound up replacing four IC chips. So now all eight voices will pass auto-tune. 
and the voices will sound consistent as we cycle through them. And there we have it. Another Oberheim that's been dormant for a really long time is back in service and ready to make some music. Hopefully you found this video helpful. This has been Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching and have a great day.